So as Kay mentioned, um, I own a small HR consulting firm called Core Report HR Consulting, and I do work with smaller organizations exactly like Kay's who really don't have the bandwidth or the need to have a full-time HR person on staff, but do have HR needs as we all do um, when we run when we're working with businesses. And I appreciate you all introducing yourselves because it kind of gives me a little idea of the audience that I'm talking to. I think right now with COVID, where we are as far as business managers or HR people or even CEOs, we're all trying to figure it out and it's very individualized to what we do as an organization. Um, how are we gonna move forward from here? But there are a couple of um, things that have been very much on my mind um, as we start to come out of this weird time that we've been in. Um, I'll just say up front that most of my clients do have a situation, they're in a situation where they don't have essential workers. I have a few that do have essential workers, but most of them are working from home and we're able to make that transition fairly successfully. Um, so most of them are facing now, how do we now transition back into the workforce? I know if you have some uh, essential workers, um, they've already been out there and you've already dealt with some of those issues. Um, but, this, but this year we were able to bring most of our non-essential workers home and a lot of them are still doing that. Um, people are still fearful. Employees are still afraid whether they're essential or not. These are the things that are you know, weighing on employer minds. How do we get our employees fully engaged again without scaring them, frankly? Um, testing and tracing seems overwhelming. So when we do return to an in-office environment or we have everybody back together, what are we gonna do about that? I'm gonna talk a little bit about vaccines. Obviously it's very controversial and we haven't really dealt with this kind of thing moving forward in the business world, at least not in the modern world. Um, there's lots of government legislation that has come out um, over the last 12 months. So I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. You, you all, I don't think are in HR, so you don't need to know them in depth, but as business managers, you should be aware of some of these um, you know, laws that are out there because they do require some notifications that you need to provide for your employees. Um, and then also just keeping in mind that currently, and this is, this is as of March 18th, we had 9.5 million workers have lost their job in the wake of the pandemic um, with 4 million out of work for, for half a year or longer. So we're still very much in this situation where it's, it's, it's not something we're used to seeing. So again, I'm in HR, as Kay mentioned, I'm not an attorney, but for my clients, I do think through these things and I'm trying to guide them through what did they need to be thinking about as we start to work through vaccines, as we start to work through hopefully getting healthy as a nation and, and as we look at you know, returning to the workplace. So I'm going to go through some of the legislation that is out there now, specifically the American Rescue Plan Act that came out recently and what that means to employers and what you need to know. Um, my clients are always asking whether they should require vaccines. So I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. Um, and when will we return to our normal work environment? Like, will we even have a normal work environment? What does that mean? Um, for some of my um, like more, you know, pharmaceutical tech professional kind of companies, they're dealing with real recruiting and retention issues because employees now like being home and they like having that flexibility. So how do we do that, you know, as we go forward? So it's a competitive issue as well. So I'm going to kind of run through all that. I encourage you to stop me at any point and let me know if you have a question. There's a lot here and I I, I kind of hesitated putting together so many slides, but there's so much to all of this. I just wanted to give you a brief overview. <clears throat> so the American Rescue Plan was passed by Congress in March. It was signed by President Biden on March 11th. The key thing for us as employers is the COBRA, COBRA subsidy that it um, allows. So for those of you who do offer health care to your employees, this is important. If you don't offer health care, care might just be a point of interest, but if you do offer health care to your employees, you need to be aware of this COBRA subsidy and what it means. So for what basically the basically this subsidy does is it says that the, it will pay, the government is going to pay 102% of the COBRA premium plus administration fee from April 1st through September 30th of this year. So for those of you who are familiar with COBRA, 
It implies to employers who provide group health plans and have 20 or more employees, and it extends the coverage of any employee who leaves your organization for 18 to 36 months, just depending on the situation. And normally under COBRA, the employee will pay the full premium for that health care coverage, plus a 2% administration fee. Typically, it's how it works. What they're proposing here with the American Rescue Plan is anybody that was laid off from April 1st to September 30th no longer has to pay that. It's going to be free. The government is going to subsidize that COBRA. Um, obviously, the employees must have elected COBRA to receive that subsidy, and it does apply to medical, dental, vision plans, and prescription blood plans. So if you offer those to your employees, they've left, they have the opportunity to enroll in COBRA, and they'll get subsidized 100% of the premium plus 2% administration fee. Very important point. Um, this is for people who leave involuntarily, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, it also allows employees, normally when you leave COBRA or you leave at a company and you move to COBRA, you typically get COBRA extension on the plan that you had when you were with that organization. Now, you have the opportunity to switch to a lower cost plan if you want to during that COBRA election period, which is a little different than before. So those are kind of the basics. Basically, we're looking at the government paying here for these folks to have health care, um, which is a huge cost to people who have either lost their job or had a reduction in hours. So in order to be eligible, employees need to be called, employees need to qualify for what is called an assistant eligible individual. That's who the individuals that may receive this subsidy. So very important, importantly, employees must have experienced an involuntary termination. Um, so they've been terminated or laid off for something that was other than gross misconduct or their hours were re reduced, which resulted in a loss of coverage. So if they were once full-time, now they've been reduced to part-time and they've lost their coverage. Does not cover voluntary termination. So if somebody quits, they are not eligible for this subsidy. And that's a really important distinction. Um, they're not clear in the law whether this reduction of hours can be voluntary. So in other words, I just decide that I want to work less hours. Does that count? I would guess not based on the fact that the voluntary piece is in there, um, but it's not completely clear. But what you need to know is if one of your, if you end up laying off an employee or an employee is involuntary terminated for any reason other than gross misconduct, they may be eligible for this subsidy. Also, the American Rescue Plan Act doesn't specifically say the loss of employment has to be due to COVID. So if you're just having general business difficulties and you maybe can't tie them to COVID, but you're doing a layoff or you have to let one or two people go, um, they could be eligible for this uh, subsidy as well. Um, and of course, it includes dependents, anybody that they had in the, on the plan. Um, another important point to remember about this is that employees that were eligible for group health coverage another way are not eligible for the subsidy. So if you have an individual who is single and doesn't have another option to go onto a spouse's plan or a domestic partner plan, they may be eligible. But if you've got an employee whose spouse or domestic partner also works and they have a plan that that employee can get onto, they need to go on that plan, not the subsidy from the government. And they also can't be eligible for Medicare. So again, I don't expect you to remember all this, just general information to have your antennas up when, when someone is leaving. Um, and it's important to note that they don't actually have to enroll in that other plan. If they're just eligible for it, for someone, a spouse's plan or something like that, then they're not eligible for the subsidy. Kind of a lot there. Questions so far on eligibility? Okay. Um, importantly, you as an employer are not paying for the subsidy. Neither is the individual who's eligible. How this is going to be completely worked out is not term, uh, completely uh, communicated to all of us yet. But I think what's going to be happening is that the um, carriers and the third party administrators who administer COBRA are simply going to look at it as fully paid. So there's, there's not going to be any you have to pay and get reimbursed. People will just be fully taken care of. So if you do work with a third party administrator to administer your COBRA, 
If you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, something like that you offer to employees, you may very well have a third party COBRA administrator. You'll want to work with them to figure out how that 2% administration fee is going to get paid um, to them for doing all of this work. But as far as the premiums is concerned, that's just going to be considered fully paid by the carriers and your employees or ex-employees will be able to remain on that benefit. Um, a couple other things that the American Rescue Plan has done to just make us all go <laughs> is they've extended the enrollment period for COBRA. It used to be that employees would have 60 days once they were terminated from a employer and terminated from a plan to enroll in, Co in COBRA. But now anyone who lost coverage before April 1st or, um, I'm sorry, anybody who left their job before April 1st and declined or discontinued their COBRA coverage can now reverse that and receive the subsidy. So just to confuse you all even more, people who originally denied it can now go back and, and, um, and sign up for it. Um, and there's some provisions there. They have to still be in their eligible period. Um, they're not otherwise qualified for another plan, as I mentioned, um, and that they receive, they sign up for the COBRA once they get that 60-day um, subsidy notice, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Long story short, there's a lot going on there. And just as employers, it's important to just generally be aware. So what do you need to do if you're in this situation and you've got benefits and you offer them to employees and you've got some employers that have left and you need to look into this, make a list of any employees who were involuntarily terminated or had their hours reduced so they're no longer eligible for benefits on or after November 1st, 2019. That's the look back period. So you'll want to get that list put together um, and then you'll want to work with your third party administrator to let them know who those folks are. I know with a lot of my clients, I'm actually getting outreach from my third party administrator. And some of you may have had that as well. That's saying, hey, here's a list of the people that we have noted as being either COBRA participants or at some point being eligible for COBRA since November 1st. Can you tell us whether they are an applicable AEI? In other words, they were involuntarily terminated or not. So a lot of these third party administrators are putting this together for you. Um, but if you are someone who either self-administers or you don't use a TPA, you're going to need to put that list together um, yourself. Um, the other thing to think about is anybody, and this is going to be something that comes up a lot, I think, anybody who went on COBRA and paid a premium for April or May or if they're really organized, June, July, they're going to have to get reimbursed if they are eligible for this subsidy. So that's something that's going to have to be thought through and worked on as well. Um, and again, if you use a third party administrator, this is a little bit easier and you just want to stay connected with them so you're aware of who qualifies and who doesn't. A lot of this guidance is still rolling out um, and a lot of it obviously is overwhelming. These third party administrators are trying to figure out how to work through all of this. But as an employer, there are notification requirements. And so either you need to work with your TPA to get those notification requires out, or you as an employer need to reach out to your COBRA participants and let them know. Um, these are just real quickly, it's probably more than you need to know, but these are the notifications. And this is the pieces of information that employers need to share with their employees, either their ex-employees, either directly or through their TPA. So they need to send them the forms necessary for electing um, and establishing eligibility for COBRA, contact information for your TPA, an explanation of the time period to elect coverage, an explanation of the obligation of the employee to inform the provider when they become eligible for other coverage. So for instance, they all, you know, their spouse gets a job and has coverage now, they can move over. Um, and there is a penalty for individuals who don't do that. Um, as well as an explanation of for of the uh, rights of and the of the COBRA subsidy. Again, if you are with the TPA, the good news is they're going to do this for you. If you're not with the TPA, the really good news is the Department of Labor is going to have a notice out, like a model notice you can use by May first. So that's by next week. They should have something out that 
fills in all that information that I just went over so you don't have to remember to do it. What I want you all to remember is just that it is a thing and it's something that employers do have an obligation to do if you offer health benefits. So you should be working with your third party provider or reaching out to your carrier directly if you need to be notifying any about this COBRA subsidy. And there are some pretty hefty fines as I've listed here um, if you don't do that. So that was the key point I wanted you all to have um, today. Some of you may have less than 20 employees, in which case COBRA is not applicable to you, but some states like North Carolina have what's called mini COBRA laws. So even you as an employer, if you have an employee who leaves, you're gonna need to, under normal circumstance, let them sign up for the state continuation under North Carolina. That same thing is in play right now. So you still need to capture a list of those who are eligible for that mini COBRA and you need to contact the carrier or if you have an administrator that handles your state COBRA and let them know um, and find out how they're gonna distribute notices so you can get those to those folks who are eligible under the state continuation in North Carolina. So just a small note there. That's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot of decoding. Um, it's a lot for employers to remember. Hopefully you all are working with a third party administrator who can help you. Um, those are the major pieces of the American Rescue Plan. Any, any questions on that piece right there, at least so far? Okay. The other one that you, the other legislation that you need to be aware of, and some of you probably already are because this came out last year, is the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. This applies to all employers with less than 500 employees. When it originally came out, it was um, offered paid sick leave to employees through the end of December 31st, 2020. They have extended that with the American Rescue Plan Act. So now, this leave can be offered by employers to their employees on a voluntary basis through the end of September this year. So it's still very much around. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what the FFCRA relief, I'm sorry, the FFCRA is, it basically offers employers a subsidy, a payroll credit, if you will, on the back end for giving employees paid leave due to COVID related reasons. I know Kay and I have talked about this, some, some things that she had to do for her employees. Um, but if somebody is sick with COVID or is being quarantining or waiting the results of a COVID test and they cannot work, so this is not for people who could work remotely from home, but they cannot work, they can receive up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at their full rate. If they are caring for a loved one, a child who is sick, a dependent who's sick, and that means they can't work, they can receive up to two thirds of their pay. Um, and then if they are uh, having to care for a child because all the schools are closed, daycares, whatnot, this was a big issue last summer. Um, you've got a little kid and you can't work because you can't send your child to daycare and you can't send your child to school, um, then you receive that two thirds pay. The important point here is you as an employer now do not need to offer this, but if you do want to offer it, you will continue to get that payroll credit and you'd work with your payroll provider to set that up. Um, also, there's a reset in the American Rescue um, Plan Act that if someone has already taken 80 hours of sick pay, they've now their 80 hours have reset and they can take more. So for those of you who don't have employees that can work remotely, they're either essential or they need to be in office or on site, this becomes something that you might want to think about offering your employees because you do get that payroll credit and it does um, you know, it's, it's, it's no cost to the company to do it, and it keeps your employees at home if they're sick instead of coming to work and sharing COVID with everybody else. Um, so I talked about the additional leave and I talked about the, the um, payroll credit. So again, that's voluntary for now, but it is something to think about. Questions on those are the really the two big uh, legislative acts. Yes, Kay. So question with that, Rachel, if we decide to utilize those eight hours, that also means, because I'm thinking of employees um, after, well, January 2021, mm -hmm. um, who were out due to COVID-related reasons, does that mean that they are not 
to utilize their PTO for for that? Is that true? So I'm not I can't require them to utilize their PTO if I'm going to move forward with the act and right. um, ask for recovery. OK, so if you decide that you're going to offer the act, then you need to offer it to everybody. So if okay. you decide that you're going to give FFCRA leave, then you you should allow people to use FFCRA if it's related to COVID um, okay. rather than having them use the PTO. But again, it's completely voluntary and you don't have to. Right. Um, but I, I, the, the, the benefit to that is you encourage people to stay home when they're sick rather than coming to work, which is important. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So how many of you debated about vaccine, vaccine? Should we require vaccines? Should we not? This is the biggest question on the market right now. How do we, what do we do about vaccines? And should I require my non-essential workers uh, to get vaccinated? And this is kind of how I feel about that <laughs> right now. <laughs> it, is, it makes me very nervous. Um, we have no, there is no standard for requiring these sorts of things and saying to employees, you must get a vaccine before you come back to work. So what I'm telling a lot of my clients right now is be, make it easy um, to get a vaccine, encourage it. You know, I've got some clients that are, you know, doing little gift cards or something to encourage it, but don't require it. And that's what I'm hearing from a lot of attorneys because there's just no guideline for what liability is gonna be on a company if I require someone to get a vaccine, just like if I required someone to come back into the workplace and they get have an adverse reaction or they get sick, it's still very wide open. So as much as you can, um, try to consider, you know, people's personal beliefs, their individual health issues and their religious beliefs. Um, people do have legit, fears about getting a vaccine. Um, so some will refuse to come to the office or their work environment um, if everyone's not vaccinated and some will refuse to get vaccinated. And there isn't right now really a black and white, what are we supposed to do about that rule? But what I am saying to my clients is don't be the first organization that defines the rules of the road because it probably means you've ended up in some sort of litigation. So just be, you know, take the attorney advice that I'm hearing, which is just be, Make it, encourage it if that's what you want to do, but don't require it. Stay flexible, stay nimble for now. And what I'm hoping is that we'll get some legislation passed that will protect organizations and so that they don't get sued for things like this. But right now, I think all the legislation is just to trying to get the economy open and, and back up and running. So that, that's not quite there yet. Um, so that's my advice there. <laughs> um, one thing on vaccines, if you do want to let your employees know, they can take FFCRA leave if you're offering it to actually get vaccinated. That was amended with the American Rescue Plan Act as well. So they can actually use FFCRA leave to go get vaccinated. And if they have symptoms, I don't know if any of you have been vaccinated. I had my second one last week. I was so sick the day after, I really didn't feel good. So that is a real thing that people are experiencing. And if they need to take a day to rest after they have the vaccine, you can count that as FFCRA leave and get the payroll credit as long as you are, of course, opted in to do that, that plan and you're doing it consistently across the organization. So what I'm understanding is soon <laughs> we're going to get guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission on vaccines because a lot of dealing with having people get these sorts of things it comes into the Americans with Disabilities Act comes into play, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, other laws under there like Title VII come into play. So as companies, we really need more guidance about what we can ask our employees to do. That is supposed to be coming um, soon, as I said. So as soon as we hear about that, I'll let Kay know and she can pass it on to all of you. Um, another thing to consider that came out last week, for those of you that have to log for OSHA, um, the if you require a vaccine as a condition of employment and someone does have an adverse reaction to that vaccine, you need to log it according to OSHA. But if you just make it a recommendation, then, and they have an adverse reaction, you no longer need to log. So just another little incentive point there for maybe not requiring vaccines, at least at this point. 
unless of course you have to because of your environment. Questions on vaccines? Okay, that's a, that's a big thing I get a lot of questions on. The other big thing is how are we gonna reopen the workplace? What are we gonna do for those of us who have had the luxury of having employees working from home, but we want them back in, what are we gonna do? And I, and I have talked to Kay about this too. It's so important to have a written solid rules and guidance in place around COVID. So it may seem secondhand to all of us now about wearing masks or washing your hands or, social distancing, but you want your employees to sign something before they come back into the office that says, I understand the rules of the road and I'm, I will follow them because I'm choosing to come back into the office. Um, make it very clear, I think we're all doing this, that to let people stay home if they're sick. Sometimes we say that to people, but then we put pressure on them to come in because we really need them to work. So make it easy for your employees to be sick. Don't make it difficult. Again, FSCRA leave can help with that, but you want to support people staying home if they don't feel well, so we can stop, the, you know, slow this down even more than we already have. Um, you are allowed to ask employees to tell you if they've been diagnosed with COVID or have COVID symptoms or they know they've been exposed because that's how we can keep track of contact tracing. But, um, you know, you just need to know that they have it and then you need to keep their name confidential. So that becomes a little tricky, I understand, but you don't ever want to share the employee's name that shared that told you, but you should let the employees know who work, let's say someone sits right next to somebody else or they work in a you know, close environment, you want to let those other employees know, hey, we've had an exposure and you've been exposed, please stay home and go get tested until you're able to come back to the office. Um, that's how, um, but you don't want to share with them what the employee name is. Um, and then, like I said, you want to have a written statement in place that has a policy that outlines the rules of the road for the office and have them sign that before they come back in. Um, I think I talked about encouraging vaccines, but don't require it. Require it. Um, be sure to let people know about the FFCRA leave, FFCRA leave if you're going to use it, because again, that's a safe um, the safety mechanism for, for keeping people home with their sick. And just generally be thoughtful and empathetic. It's a really tough time for everybody. Everybody's fear level is different. Some people are pretty laissez-faire about this. Other people are completely freaked out and you don't know what their home life, if they've got someone who's got immune issues or health issues at home that they're afraid of bringing something to them. Um, so be aware of that. And just look at what's right for your organization. Like I said at the beginning, we're all so different and our individual work environments are really company to company and what's gonna work for another company may not work for you. So talk to your employees, listen to them, listen to their fears, and then just you know use your, your best instinct, instincts to be as empathetic and kind of creative as you can about getting people back. Um, staying competitive. I don't know if any of you have, have had that. I, um, I don't know if this relates to you, but a lot of my clients were talking yesterday about how Apple is opening this huge office here in the triangle and people are worried about, you know, their employees leaving and going to work for Apple because Apple's advertising that they're going to pay all this kind of money top to bottom. Um, so staying competitive is going to be really important as we come out of this and flexibility is going to be key in the post COVID world. I was just talking to someone else about this. Employees now, if they've had the option to stay home and be flexible, they really do enjoy that. Um, and that's kind of a reality. I think that's here to stay for a while. Um, they've, they've been doing it for, for a good amount of time. So when I talk to um, my employees and I ask them if they've been working at home, what do they feel about it? How's it going? This is pretty much what I get. They love it. Employees that can work from home really like it. If it's anything from, I'm just there for my kids if they need me, I don't have to commute which was killing me, taking 45 minutes each way out of my day. Um, I can go for a walk at four o'clock and work a little later if I want, whatever the case may be, they really like it. So from a competitive standpoint, we as employers are just gonna have to be a little bit more nimble, if we can, not all this can be, on allowing employees some more flexibility in their work day, because a lot of companies are gonna offer it. Um, 
I think I kind of talked about this. So, you know, just stay flexible, recruiting and retention. This is a hot issue for keeping employees engaged right now. They want, they want that flexibility. And I, I do have a lot of companies talk to me about their concerns around culture and how are we going to build a culture if everyone's working remote? And I'm not suggesting that everybody work remote every day. I'm just suggesting for whatever kind of organization that you have, give thought to making it a little bit more flexible than it was before, because that is now a huge asset to employees and they really like that so as much as you can. A um, couple of resources, even if you're not in HR, you're just a manager, these are some really good resources to follow that I like to follow so I can stay on top of these legislative uh, changes that are coming out. Um, Eric Meyer is a guy that I follow. Um, he's got a blog called the Employer Handbook blog, and he puts out a um, pretty much once a day. He's an attorney up in Philadelphia. And again, he'll say, I'm not giving you personal advice, but he gives you like trends and he really watches what's going on in the employment arena and sends out really short, concise, um, employer focused emails about things that you as an employer need to be aware of. So he's great. Society for Human Resources Management is not just for HR people, but it's for you as a manager, it's for company heads, people who want to learn more. Um, the Department of Labor OSHA site, if OSHA is something you need to think about, has great coronavirus resources and I put the website there. And then just make sure you're checking the North Carolina Department of Labor and Department of Health and Human Services sites frequently because they put out a lot of guidance for employers um, and what they need to do. And you can sign up for any of those kind of federal or state notification systems. It's a lot. It's a lot more than we ever used to have to think about for as employers. Um, but Hopefully that gives you a little bit of guidance and you're welcome to reach out with questions if you have them or throw them at me right now. How many of you are actually in a situation where you're dealing with these, these questions? We're a large organization, Rachel, and um, we've, we've had to deal with this a lot. So, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, you got your back office work and then you've got your branch network. So there's a, you know, a lot going on with work from home now that didn't used to be, but your branch network can't work from home. So it can be challenging. It is. It brings up a good point. There's a whole fairness thing too, right? From the employee's perspective, well, they can work from home. Why can't that? Like, hey, I know you probably have a little bit of that too. That is definitely something else that we're struggling with. And, you know, what I've said to people, I have said to many clients, talk to your employees, Find out what they're interested in, but make sure they understand it's not a democracy either, especially with the big credit union. They're, they're, your decisions are going to be made at the top, but it's worth getting insight from people about what they want. I don't think most people want to be five days a week at home. I just think they want a little more flexibility. You know, right. it's still, they've been locked up for a year. They want to be able to get out and see people, but they're used to a little more fluidity in their day. Um, and I think you know, how many times an employee says to me, well, we've proven over the last year that we can be more productive. I'm more productive at home than I am in the office. And there's probably some validity to that to a certain extent, because you're not getting all the interruptions and meeting at the coffee, um, coffee bar or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. And it's in the, in the companies that are offering that flexibility, I think are the ones who are going to really attract the top talent. So it's a struggle for a lot of CEOs and presidents right now to figure out what they want to do. Yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah. I know too, Rachel, we uh, will be returning to the, the office, I think the end of the summer mm -hmm. and just kind of, I was just kind of getting a feel from staff. And when you look at the dynamics of the, the staff currently, we had a staff person who just lost her husband who has small children at home. Mm -hmm. So I know for her having that flexibility to be at home, not just for them, but also there may be a day when she may not feel, you know, yeah. like coming in the office, yeah. but she can work from home and do the, and, you know, perform the same duties. Yeah. So that is something that I am really thinking about with our advocates during the day is, is having that, um, flexible schedule that probably in the office three days a week mm -hmm. working from home too because we have found even with the services that we provide we can do that mm -hmm. um, there was a time that we had all of our core advocates out due to um, COVID 
Yeah. So that was a first, but we had to pivot and we learned that we were able to complete orders over the phone. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in order to keep staff, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you're talking about Apple, but also we've lost staff to Amazon yes. because of not only the salary, but all the benefits that they offer as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, we are really thinking about moving forward. What does that look like? Yeah. in order to provide staff some flexibility that yeah. they are won't yeah 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 is uh, tammy i'm interested what is the credit union doing are they requiring everybody back yet or they say i, I have a lot of people who are saying fall <laughs> think about it in the fall well uh for our back office right now we're still doing like a week in the office a week at home okay. for, for them um a few branches may have some folks that have some health issues that we've allowed to work from home. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, it's a different dynamic for the, the branch network, um, work from home. Uh, but we see it change. We hope, you know, with COVID uh, and the vaccines that things are gonna... Now, Becky worked from home. She was back office and she worked from home. Now, she's a big advocate to go back to work. <laughs> I am. I, I, I personally didn't enjoy work from home. I felt like yeah. that I was um, just distracted a lot. Um, you know, when you're, when you come into the office, you get up, you, you shower, you get dressed, you brush your teeth, you get to the office. And, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're working from home, you're like, I can just, you know, throw on this t-shirt and put my hair back and right. sit here for the day. I just enjoy coming to the office um, yeah. my, myself. So when you said people love it, I was like, well, gosh, what's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, absolutely. There are some people who do. I mean, I even some of the offices I go into, I mean, I go into an office twice a week just because I need to change the scenery. Um, yeah. So that's part of it too. And there are people, but I would say, I think overwhelmingly, at least the people I'm working with, it's the flexibility of the whole thing. So if I want to go in, I can go in. If I don't want to go in, I don't have to go in. Like that's the stuff I think that they enjoy. To Kay's right. point, maybe one day where you just don't feel like it. Um, and I think the commute is, I don't know how far some of your folks commute, but I've heard that a lot that people are like, I'm getting an hour and a half back in my day because I don't have to commute. Oh yeah. That's a big thing. Uh, we're in, you know, with us being in Johnston County, most of our op operation centers are in Raleigh. So that is a big deal for folks is the commute. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, it's a balancing act with your branch. We have such a large branch network in North Carolina yeah. Yeah. and then we've got, you know, the operations. So it's, uh. It's been interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a lot of unknown questions. And like I said, I just think being nimble and empathetic right now is kind of the best way to go because I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know like what's going to happen with how, what is going to be the burden on an employer. Like it's just so wide open right now. And unfortunately we live in a litigious society and you just, you're going to get some attorneys who just have a really good time with this whole thing and you don't want to oh, yeah. be that company. Um, Plus, like I said, from a recruiting and retention standpoint, so, so. I was just going to jump in and add, I mean, we are pretty much declaring this a time, a um, workforce crisis time period, because as we are starting to open, we are hearing from more and more businesses, um, you know, businesses are, are thriving and they're expanding and then they have all these employee meant needs, but then we can't find the, they can't find the folks to fill those open jobs. And there are hundreds and thousands of jobs across the state. We're trying to uh, find what real those real numbers for our region here. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've put out a survey to our membership um, and we're asking for folks to, to tell us just how many open positions do you currently have? We've also opened up our um, job board uh, for anyone to post open positions and they can do that. They can go straight to our uh, website, triangleeastchamber.com and, and put your open positions there. Um, just really trying to give those tools to our companies who are trying to, you know, fill that need. And, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a, uh, and transportation does come into play. You talk about getting an hour and a half to two hours of your day back. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we look at transportation as well. And, um, you know, maybe you know, commuter rail and how, how can we bring other folks from other um, parts of the, of the region into Johnston County to fill this. Right. Spots. And if you listen to economists, it's like they're predicting the next couple of years are just going to be a boom. So where are all these employees going to come from is a really big question. Um, 
It's, well, um, and that's one thing with the credit union. We've kind of, um, we've, we've done pretty much a hiring freeze right. um, and really looking at the organization, you know, transactions have dropped uh, in some areas, but then in other areas, like phone calls has increased. Mm. Um, so we're uh, a branch that we're, we're, we're ready to hire again. <laughs> we're being told, hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting, Kelly, that you said that there were a lot of jobs open in Johnson County. I didn't realize that. So. Oh, yes. Yes. But I also think, you know, we need to be able to provide support for our employers, you know, because here, you know, they have less staff, but, you know, business is booming in, so, in certain industries and people are doing more with less. And so, you know, there's frustrations with, with employees who, you know, again, as we've talked about folks who um, can't come in or want to work from home or, or won't come in, you know. Um, and then there's those folks who are there and they're like, well, I'm here, why can't they come? You know, so there's that frustration. So how, what's the support for our employers in dealing with that, those kinds of personalities and um, situations. Yeah. And that's the tough part right now because a lot of times we can put together a policy or you know guidelines for our organization that says this is how we operate. But in this situation, whether it be, you know, let's say vaccines, for instance, I don't want to get vaccinated or I'm not coming in if not everybody's vaccinated. How do you mandate that? I mean, just right now, it's just it's hard to do. Um, so it's a lot of questions out there. Yeah. I do think that, you know, eventually we'll get beyond COVID, but it has, there's a heightened sense of um, being aware of your, of your health, your employee's health um, and those around you. And so, I mean, do you foresee uh, companies maybe, you know, revising their sick leave policies to, you know, give more days or, you know, those kinds of things? coming out of this because even just the common cold can shut a lot of, you know, the flu, you know, those kinds of things. Right. Well, yeah, I think when we, when we do get back into the office, two things, I actually do have a couple of clients I've already offered like unlimited wellness. So if you're sick, it's unlimited. Um, and then I don't, we're not going to be able to come back as a full workforce. So if you just take, for instance, back office or wherever you are, um, you have to give a lot of thought to how many people are in that room at one time, even maybe once we get to that herd immunity that they're hoping that we get to, because nobody, I mean, I'm thinking of some place I go into where there's like a desk and then a desk and then a desk and then a desk. Nobody wants to sit like that next to anybody anymore. You know, it gives you kind of the heebie-jeebies. So I think even when we do return to the office, where we're working within the company and how we structure our spaces is going to get different as well to give people more of that comfort level. Um, and yeah, we've got to make it easier for people to take sick days. I mean, how many times do you have an employee come in and they've got a cold and you're like, why are you here? You know, and they're like, I got so much to do or I feel bad taking the day or whatever. Um, and now people are going to be really heightened and, and sensitive to that. So we've got to not only offer the leave to employees, but we have to support them taking sick leave when they are truly sick um, and not making them feel like they're putting burdens on others or, you know, they're, they're not being a team player. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I had, I had a CFO say to me yesterday, he wants a flexible thing because he said, you know, at four o'clock, I've started this habit at four o'clock every Friday, or I'm sorry, four o'clock every day, I go for a walk with my kids like just a brief walk for like 30 minutes, you know, and I know I'm going to get my work done, but that to me is a new ritual from this whole thing that I don't want to give up, you know? Um, and again, to that flexibility standpoint, he, he is struggling on what to do with returning people to the office because he himself is enjoying um, that new work-life balance that has been found, which is a good thing. I think, I think it's healthier. Although to your, to your point, it, sometimes I feel like the day never ends because you don't have to get up from the office and leave. Sometimes I'm like, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> <Not enough. laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, I hope you guys found this helpful. You're welcome to reach out. I know everybody's in a different place because you have such a diverse group here. 
Um, but I think we're all kind of struggling a little bit with what are we required to do and what should we be doing and how do we do it? And I think the more we talk to each other as companies, the more helpful that is to get ideas of what other companies are starting to do. And, and I, I think a lot of the um, companies here in the Raleigh, like RTP area, those like sort of companies are really looking at keeping things status quo through September and not having people come back in yet just because there's so many unanswered questions. I don't know what you guys are seeing down there, but that's kind of what I'm seeing here in the, the Raleigh-Durham area. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Rachel? Um, very good presentation and very good session. Um, truly gave us something to, to, to consider and to think about and to even take back to um, upper management if we need to um because this is something that we're going to have to address um in order to get those employees who, who really fit our culture so um thank you again for taking the time out rachel to to, to just share with us your area of expertise and, and things that we need to be thinking about um thank you all for joining